And so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you, uh, Dr. Alice Rothschild, who is an author, filmmaker, and physician, and is focused on human rights and social justice. She writes and lectures widely and um, has authored several books on health and human rights in Israel, Palestine, including Broken Promises, Broken Dreams, Stories of Jewish and Palestinian Trauma and Resilience, and uh, Condition Critical, Life and Death in Israel, Palestine, contributed to a number of anthologies, the most recent being Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism, Stories of Personal Transformation, and What Jer Jerusalem Means to Us, Jewish Reflections and Perspectives. Finding Melody Sullivan is her young adult novel exploring grief and friendship in the setting of broader political uh, questions raised by realities in Israel and Palestine, which is available in print and as an audio book. Old enough to know her middle uh, grade novel is about a nine-year-old Palestinian American boy and his grandmother from the Ada refugee camp. Uh, for more information, uh, go to the website uh, www.alicerothschildbooks.com. She directed a documentary film, Voices Across the Divide. She is a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, Health Advisory Council, the mentor liaison for what are, we are not numbers, a program for young Gaza writers and on the board of Gaza Mental Health Foundation. She was last in Israel, uh, the West Bank and Gaza in August of this past year. Uh, as a, uh, Previously mentioned, she's a physician. She has traveled to Gaza four times. The last visit uh, in August, and uh, in this online Zoom webinar, Alice will give a brief background on Gaza and then a detailed description of the current destruction of much of the infrastructure and healthcare system and the impact on civilians in the ongoing war. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, turn it over to Dr. Alice Rothschild. Thank you. Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. So bear with me for one second here. Okay. So um, I'm happy to see all of you, so let's get going. This is a talk on health and human rights consequences of the current war on Gaza. So I think the first thing to understand is that healthcare in Gaza is provided in the context of a siege, checkpoints, closures, curfews, a strict permitting system, which means that anything that comes in or goes out um, has to be approved by the uh, Israeli government. Then there is a separation apartheid wall, militarized fence that encloses Gaza. There are frequent Israeli incursions, massive assaults, frequent detentions, and factual, factional violence. So as we uh, start thinking about these issues, I think it's important to keep some ethical questions in the forefront. One is, uh, what is the role of international law? And uh, what is the impact of collective civilian punishment and restrictions of access? What happens when you ghettoize an entire population? What happens with mass incarceration, especially of children? And then the whole issue of the proportionality in war. And it's important to remember that healthcare and healing occur in a socio-political context. So we need to have political solutions to health and human rights issues. And you should ask yourself, why is life expectancy in Israel 10 years more than in the West Bank and Gaza? Why is maternal mortality nine to 10 times greater in the occupied territories than in Israel? Now, 
Uh, I think that you probably have aware that a number of human rights organizations have uh, stated that the um, behavior of the Israeli government is consistent with Israeli apartheid and war crimes. And this is just an example from Betselem, which is an Israeli human rights organization. And they stated that a regime that uses laws, practices, and organized violence to establish and maintain the supremacy of one group over another is an apartheid regime. Now, we also have the fact that there is something called medical apartheid. And we really saw this uh, during the beginnings of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what I mean by this is that the Oslo Accords in 1994 set up the Palestinian Authority to maintain responsibility for the management of healthcare in the occupied territories. But that was predated by the Geneva Accords, which mandated that the occupying power is responsible for combating contagious diseases and epidemics. And what happened was that Israel wanted the Palestinians in the territories to have the responsibilities of sovereignty, which means providing health care, without the benefits of so sovereignty, which means having the resources and control over the system. So a person's response to the COVID-19 pandemic totally depended on their geographic, ethnic, and political status. And so I'm just gonna read this slide because it's the sort of take home message if you only take home one thing. Uh, more than 75 years of Israeli domination and dispossession has affected Palestinian life through occupation, siege, annexation, de-development, and permanent displacement of refugees severely impacting the ability of Palestinians to access the essential building blocks of health. The fragmentation of society and destruction of the ability and opportunity to create essential institutions involved in healthcare has created a reality that is recognized today as medical apartheid, two separate systems with two separate realities. And we see this in the disparities in life expectancy and maternal and infant mortality. And when I say the de-development of the healthcare system, what I mean is that the Israeli government has a deliberate policy of not allowing the healthcare system to grow and flourish. It excludes certain equipment. It doesn't allow um, the staff to get training outside of the strip. There are all sorts of ways that they destroy the healthcare system slowly but surely. Then there's the whole aspect of the medical permitting system. If a patient needs high level care, for instance, in Israel or in the East Jerusalem, uh, they have to go through bureaucratic hurdles to get the permit, which often uh, it's never guaranteed and sometimes comes late. Then, as I said, there's a chronic lack of critical medications and equipment, and um, then direct attacks on the healthcare system and high levels of conflict related trauma. I also wanna just put this out there that there's an impact of Zionism on medicine. So in 2018, the nation state bill was passed by the Israeli Knesset, that's their parliament, and it officially privileged Jewish citizens of Israel over Palestinians. And so there is a form of legal institutional racism in Israel. And so we have to ask ourselves, are Jewish Israeli clinicians able to see Palestinian citizens of Israel, or for that matter, Palestinians in the territories as fellow equal human beings? And I should point out that last November, a uh, hundred physicians, Israeli physicians, wrote a letter approving the bombing of Gaza hospitals. Now I'm gonna talk about health in its broadest sense as the right to health, which was defined by Physicians for Human Rights Israel. So this involves uh, the ability to have freedom of movement and access to health services, and then all the things that make up a healthy society, clean water, sanitation, adequate nutrition, housing, education, employment, and the ability to live in a nonviolent world. And if you look at the picture on the right, that is a patient education pamphlet from Palestinian Medical Relief Society. And along with their patient education pamphlets about uh, breastfeeding your baby and taking calcium, this is one about what to do if you're stuck in labor at a checkpoint. Now, I keep mentioning international human rights law. This was codified in the four Geneva Conventions of 1949, which were designed to protect civilians in times of war and treats as war crimes, the murder of civilians, torture, rape, and hostage taking. So these are part of an international body of law that governs the relationships between different states. 
Now, over the years, there have been additional protocols that relate to the protection of victims in armed conflict, as well as other agreements that prohibit the use of certain weaponry, military tactics, etc. In 2000, there was also the protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, involving uh, the, stating what the involvement of children in armed conflict should be. Now, if we look at healthcare in Palestine, it has been described as fragmented and incoherent by The Lancet, which is a prominent medical journal in the UK. So in terms of institutions, we have the Ministry of Health, which, as I said, was established in 1994 after the Oslo Accords. Then we have the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, which I'm sure you've noticed has been in the news a lot lately. Um, and that was established in 1950 to provide health care, housing, and food to uh, Palestinian refugees created after the 48 war. So there are eight incredibly crowded refugee camps in Gaza and uh, 23 in the West Bank and then others in other Arab speaking countries. Then we have non-governmental organizations such as Palestinian Medical Relief Society. We have the private providers. And then we have the role of the Israeli government in active de-development. And I should just add that if a Palestinian lives in East Jerusalem or in what we call Israel 48, the Israel that has the armistice line from 48, they have access to the Israeli healthcare system, which involves five HMOs as well as private care. Now, I just want to do a very quick um, update on the facts of occupation and Gaza. After the 48 war, Gaza was uh, controlled by Egypt. And then in 67, it was occupied by Israel after the Six Day War. Uh, Jewish settlers were encouraged to go settle in Gaza. And then in 2005, the Jewish Israeli settlers were unilaterally withdrawn. The following year, there was a democratic election that was certified by Jimmy Carter, and Hamas won the legislative election. And then the year after that, there was a civil war uh, with Hamas versus Fatah. Fatah partially funded uh, by the US in this war, and Hamas won. And thus, the siege began led by the US and Israel. Since then, there have been multiple Israeli assaults, uh, 2008, 2012, 2014, 2021, 2022, and the latest that started October 7th of 23. There was also from 2018 to 2019, a weekly, uh, mostly nonviolent Great March of Return to the perimeters of Gaza. And these um, uh, protesters were met with Israeli snipers who had um, the goal of uh, shooting at their lower extremities, uh, creating huge numbers of orthopedic injuries, mostly in young people. Now, if we look at this picture I took in 2014, this was to remind me that the issues in Gaza are not new. This is a man with his horse-drawn cart bringing canisters of fuel for electricity generators because Gaza has a long-standing issue of inadequate amount of electricity. Now, if we just look at Gaza, if you look in the upper uh, left, uh, you can see Israel with the West Bank being the kidney shaped um, thing on the on the east side of Israel. And the little black line is Gaza Strip. South of that is Egypt. East of that is Jordan and then Syria and then Lebanon. If we look at the blow up of Gaza, there is a, a border crossing in the north. That's Erez crossing, which is how people like me get in and out. And there is a border crossing in the south with Egypt in Arafah, which is how Palestinians get in and out. There are also border crossings along the perimeter fence on the east, which are with Israel for commercial items. And so the one I'm going to talk about later is this one in the south, which is Karam Sholom. And Gaza is really tiny. It's about 28 miles long and six miles wide. So if you superimpose it on the state of Massachusetts, which is a tiny state, you can see how tiny it actually is. Now, as of now, um, more than half of Gaza's 2.3 million people are sheltering in the south, in the Rafah area. And most of them are living in tents, in rickety shelters, in rubble. There's a desperate need for food, shelter, water, and medicine. And Netanyahu has ordered these civilians to evacuate because he's planning a massive a ground assault on Rafah. And he keeps saying there's going to be safe zones, but most experts feel, and I agree, that there is nowhere safe in Gaza. There is no place to go. And so what many of us are worried about is an impending massacre. Oops, sorry. 
Now, I've been in Gaza uh, four times, each time with different NGOs, and uh, last time in August, as was mentioned, and i am always been invited by the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. So over the years, I've done direct services, women's empowerment groups, and a lot of interviewing and documenting. And I also work with a number of groups uh, that work with Gazans. Now, when I was there in August, around 18,000 Palestinians from Gaza were working in Israel. They had economic permits. And it should be noted that these permits do not cover work-related injury or death. So these workers are in high-risk fields like agriculture and construction. And when they get injured or sick, uh, they have no health care rights. And basically, the employers drive them to the Erez checkpoint and dump them back into Gaza, where it's unlikely they'll be able to get the medical care that they need. Now, when I was there, for the first time, I saw child beggars on the street. I heard reports of men selling their kidneys to feed their families. I found families that were not able to afford olive oil. In August, the UN Right to Health program noted that the number of exits for people leaving Gaza was 88% below the monthly average in 2000. And it was mostly all the work-related purposes of these workers going into Israel. Only 6% of the exits were for patients referred for medical treatment, and about a fifth of them were not approved on time. Now, before the aggression, uh, uh, there were 13 governmental hospitals in Gaza, 142 primary healthcare centers, some run by the Ministry of Health, some by UNRWA, and some by non-governmental organizations. There were about 40 private schools, uh, two med uh, private hospitals, two medical schools, and then a host of nursing schools and professional schools. But there's a total mismatch between the number of professionals and the number of available paying jobs. So there are about 120 nursing positions open each year in Gaza, this is before the attack, um, and 5,000 nursing students. There, are, there were less than 20 psychiatrists in Gaza and less than seven of them are physicians. Now, the big health problems before October were, number one, the electricity shortage, and electricity was on for 48 hours per day at erratic times. The fuel shortages um, were uh, related to fuel that was used not only for ambulances, but for the electricity generators, and the shortages occasionally led to hospitals closing. And then I've mentioned there were severe restrictions on the permits to leave and on getting medicine and equipment in. And because uh, doctors couldn't get out, there's a severe lack of specialists because they can't get extra training. So the medical personnel were exhausted. Often their salaries are unpaid and they were pretty uh, decimated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, um, as I mentioned, UNRWA is a critical player here. And I think you have to ask, are we witnessing the destruction of UNRWA funding? So the funding was slashed by Trump. It was partially restored by Biden. And UNRWA was threatening before the war, uh, this latest war, to cease operations because they were having a major budget crisis. And this was in the face of rising poverty, malnutrition, and unemployment. And then on January 26, the Israeli government accused UNRWA of having uh, 13 employees that had participated in the Hamas attack. And uh, at that point, without any further investigation, and uh, despite the fact that UNRWA fired these employees and has a policy of neutrality, 13 countries immediately suspended their funding of UNRWA to the tune of $667 million. And since then, uh, we really see uh, the destruction of UNRWA in real time. And this has been a goal of the Israeli government for a long time. So in our own Congress, we have at least eight bills trying to eliminate UNRWA and stopping USA to countries to fund UNRWA. In Israel, we have the Israeli Land Authority telling UNRWA they have to vacate uh, Kalandia Vocational Training Center in East Jerusalem and demanding that they pay a usage fee of 4.5 US million dollars. The deputy mayor of Jerusalem has taken steps to evict UNRWA from its headquarters of 75 years in East Jerusalem, which was granted by Jordan. Um, visas for most international staff uh, have been now limited to one to two months. The Ministry for Finance is revoking UNRWA's tax exemption privileges, and customs authorities have stop, started suspending shipment of UNRWA goods. An Israeli bank has blocked the UNRWA account. Hundreds of UNRWA local staff have been refused access uh, to Jerusalem since October, and so they're unable to reach UNRWA's headquarters, the UNRWA schools, and health centers. And at the end of January, Netanyahu stated that UNRWA was, quote, in the service of Hamas. And this is without much uh, evidence whatsoever. And many Israeli officials have now called for donors to cease funding UNRWA. And it's important to remember that this is going to undermine education, 
health, and other services that are essential to human rights and continued existence of Palestinian refugees created in 1948 and 1967. Now, as I mentioned, the siege um, involves uh, tight control over everything that comes in and goes out, but there are other measures that the Israeli government takes. They have a policy of fumigating the farmland along the eastern perimeter fence. They generally do this right before harvest, and they fumigate it with herbicides to kill the crops and poison the soil. They've decimated the fishing industry. This is a picture of um, the Gaza port in Gaza City, which now no longer exists. Um, but uh, before the war, the fishermen were um, severely limited in how far they could go out. Their boats were frequently attacked. They were frequently shot. Um, the Israelis really crushed uh, this industry. And you got to remember that Gaza has a fishing culture. It's a coastal plain. The other thing that the Israeli uh, military has done is that before harvesting uh, along the eastern perimeter, they will intentionally flood the crops from the Israel side, again, destroying the food being harvested. Now, in the middle of all of this is 2.3 million Gazans, 50% under the age of 18. Now, what we're seeing in terms of healthcare is the total destruction of the healthcare system. Uh, there are about 30,000 people that have now been killed in Gaza and over 70,000 injured. In Israel, 1,162 were killed during the Hamas attack. In Gaza, uh, Israel has lost uh, 238 soldiers killed and 1,400 injured. And it's estimated that there are about 136 hostages left in Gaza. If you look at the pattern of airstrikes, uh, the Israeli um, uh, military has bombed homes, civilian gatherings, markets, houses of worship, bakeries, restaurants, banks, ATM machines, hospitals, healthcare facilities, ambulances. They have made a full electricity blackout and there is a severe lack of fuel importation. So at this point uh, in Gaza, 12 of the 36 hospitals are partially functional. There's also um, something that happens where people uh, who are displaced uh, run to the hospitals thinking they will be safe. So there are thousands and thousands of people overcrowding these hospitals. And I just wanna make it clear that according to international law, if a hospital is functioning as a hospital, is filled with patients, with patients in surgery, with women having babies, it's functioning as a hospital, it is against international law to bomb a hospital. Now we also know that 60%, more than 60% of the housing units have been destroyed or damaged. 75% uh, of the internally displaced people, 75% uh, of the internally displaced people are now sheltering in UNRWA designated uh, facilities and various kinds of shelters. As I mentioned, there are severe shortages of water and medicine and rationing of water to very extreme low amounts. Um, there is a risk of famine and starvation and it's no longer a potential risk. People are actually uh, chronically hungry and there are pockets of people who are actually starving. Um, with all of this horror, there are increasing communal tensions, intracommunal tensions and increasing gender-based violence. There are also estimated to be between 50 and 60,000 pregnant women. Now, what we see is direct, deliberate Israeli attacks on healthcare. Many hundreds of healthcare personnel have been killed. I couldn't get an accurate count for today, so I've just left it at many hundreds, uh, but it's over 300. There are uh, more than 121 ambulances destroyed, 161 US staff killed, UN staff killed, and more than two thirds of the hospitals and health centers are no longer functioning due to the strikes and lack of fuel. There have been no medical permits to the West Bank or Israel for high level care. There has been uh, reports of major unusual burns on the dead and the wounded, which is raising the specter of the use of white phosphorus, which is a weapon that is illegal in urban areas. And it should also be noted that women have almost no menstrual or hygiene products. Now, as you can imagine, this affects the mental health of everyone. There are reports uh, that children are um, particularly vulnerable. Um, and so children have been reported as developing convulsions, increasing levels of bedwetting. Bedwetting is a chronic issue for Palestinian children, but this is now worse. Immense fear, aggressive behavior, nervousness, and refusal to leave their parents' side. To the point that UNICEF now describes Gaza as the most dangerous place in the world to be a child. Now, I mentioned the Karam Sholem crossing between um, 
Israel and Gaza and the Rafah crossing, there are now hundreds and hundreds of trucks carrying food, water, and medical supplies waiting to be let in. They are intermittently let in in small amounts. And once they get into Gaza, it is a huge challenge to drive anywhere <clears throat> because they are mopped by desperate starving people and because the highways are all bombed to smithereens. Uh, telecom has been intermittently blacked out. Uh, the Israeli def Defense Force recently destroyed Al Isra uh, University, which was the last remaining university in Gaza. They've destroyed all the other ones. And they've also bombed libraries, archives, museums, and uh, damaged and destroyed them. Now, um, we know, looking at agriculture, that there has been major damage to over a third of all cropland, to a fifth of all greenhouses, to almost 500 agricultural wells, and to most of the agri-food infrastructure. We see water being used as a weapon of war. Uh, the water is 95% contaminated, and the infrastructure to uh, purify it and to uh, spread it around has been destroyed. Most sewage pumping stations and all five wastewater treatment plants are shut down. So now we see the phenomenon of raw sewage continuously being dumped into the Mediterranean Sea where people are washing their clothes, bathing, and sometimes drinking the water. And it's actually much worse now uh, with the cold, rainy weather. I've been in Gaza in January. It's pretty miserable and the rain is um, awful. And um, so now there is more flooding going on and the flooding is often raw sewage. With these horrific hygiene uh, situation, we see things like chickenpox, scabies, lice, diarrhea, respiratory illnesses, and hepatitis A significantly increasing. There are an estimated 6,200 people awaiting transfer to, for treatment abroad and over 10,000 cancer patients who are at risk for death because they have not been able to get their treatments. And I should also mention that there's a severe lack of painkillers. So a lot of these cancer patients are suffering extreme pain without morphine or Demerol or the things they could use in the past. Now, we also see an increase in the denial for humanitarian missions uh, by the Israeli uh, military, particularly when it comes to missions going to the north. We see a high risk of explosive ordnance and unexploded ordnance, obviously. Um, and through all of this, Palestinian armed groups continue their indiscriminate rocket fire into Israel and uh, fierce fighting on the ground. And the civilians are again caught in the middle. And so more and more human rights groups, legal groups, and other uh, thoughtful people are describing this as reaching the level of a genocide and that there have been multiple war crimes. Now, I just want to remind people that things are also happening in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, which most people forget since all eyes are on Gaza. There are, have been multiple Israeli attacks on Janine, Tulkarm, Nablus, and other places. There has been obstruction of ambulances. There have been waves of resistance and arrests and detentions. More than 400 Palestinians have been killed. And um, the Jewish settlers in uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem have basically been given a green light by Netanyahu to just go crazy. So they are attacking Palestinians, especially in Area C, which is the 65% of the West Bank that is totally controlled by Israel. They are seizing land. They are running people out of their homes. They are setting up illegal outposts. And Netanyahu and his henchmen also did a mass uh, distribution of guns. So these folks are heavily armed. There has been a 60% increase in home demolitions in East Jerusalem. Now, I want to just do a little uh, information on the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which opened in 1990. Um, they have uh, three, or they had three centers and five mobile clinics. The picture on the right is one I took last August. This is a new building from 2019, state of the art, gorgeous kind of facility. And uh, the Gaza Community Mental Health Program does uh, mental health training, a lot of direct care, community education. They work hard to reduce the social stigma of mental illness. They have a telephone hotline and their focus was on women, children and prisoners as well as chronic traumatic stress disorder because in Gaza, uh, stress disorders are never post. And they're very impressive because they use evidence-based interventions. Now, I know that this area uh, received massive bombing, that the roads around this building are all cratered, the windows have been blown out, and I cannot find any uh, information about whether the building is actually still standing. So all centers have been closed. Uh, there's no electricity. Um, the patients were given the phone numbers of their therapists, but if they have no electricity, no internet, they can't use their phones. So it's getting in contact with therapists is very hard. 
Patients now have to buy their own meds at full cost. Um, they don't have the money. The pharmacies don't have the meds. So people are largely untreated. And the other thing to remember is that the staff the people who are providing the care are as traumatized as their patients. They have fled to the South. They have lost tens of family members. They are living in tents with you know, 10 other people. So it's an incredibly difficult situation. Now, I also wanna just mention briefly uh, the pregnant women in Gaza. Um, now I wrote um, an op-ed that was published in the New York Times, if you want more information. Uh, this is a picture from the New York Times of uh, babies in the NICU uh, who when the incubator electricity failed, they put all the babies next to each other, hoping that they could keep each other warm. So there are 5,500 approximately births per month. Most of these women now have no prenatal care. Many of them are internally displaced and unclear where they will deliver. So we see about 180 women a day giving birth without adequate prenatal or obstetrical care. We see women um, undergoing cesarean sections without pain relief. We see women delivering in hospitals if they don't get killed on the way to the hospital, um, discharged within hours after delivery. And they're not discharged to a nice warm home, they're discharged to a shelter or a tent. And it's estimated that 15% of these are high risk pregnancies. So we see women giving birth in shelters in their homes, you know, with 40 family members in the streets amid the rubble and in these very overwhelmed healthcare facilities. As you can imagine, the sanitation situation is horrific. The risk of infection and medical complications is on the rise. And there is documentation of newborns dying from these conditions. Now we know that um, starvation, dehydration, the lack of food and clean water impacts everyone. Uh, babies, pregnant women and breastfeeding women are particularly vulnerable. So this situation not only impacts the health of the mother and the baby, it also impacts bonding and breastfeeding. So if you can imagine if you're dehydrated and starving and stressed, you're not gonna be able to breastfeed your baby well. So you need to buy formula. So you need to have money to buy formula. You get the powder, then you need to be able to mix it with water. The water is all contaminated and then the baby gets hep A. So you can see that this catastrophe is just mushrooming. Um, and we expect that maternal deaths are going to increase. And there's also a huge psychological toll. And this sometimes has deadly consequences on reproductive health. There is a documented uh, rise in stress-induced miscarriages of 300%. And given the situation, we expect an increase in congenital abnormalities, stillbirths, and premature births. And as you can imagine, this will have a multi-generational impact. Now, you are probably aware that South Africa launched a uh, complaint uh, accusing Israel of uh, genocidal intent with the International uh, Court of um, Justice. And um, it, this is a mistake, it should say Court of Justice. And in 1948, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide stated that genocide is defined as specific acts committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And in this includes killing members of the group and deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And it's also interesting, there was an article in The Guardian last month that talked about the longstanding policies of successive U.S. governments that have shielded Israel from U.S. laws, especially the Leahy law, which is supposed to prevent the U.S. from funding of human rights abuses abroad. Now, the ICJ has um, issued a preliminary decision. They said that South Africa does have standing to bring this complaint, that this could be genocide. The Palestinians are a protected group. They reviewed the horrific conditions in Gaza and the dehumanizing racist fascistic language coming from many Israeli ministers. And they said that Israel must take action and prevent genocidal acts, increase aid and report back in a month, which is today, and that uh, Hamas has to release the hostages. Now, there are other things going on. I'll just cite another example. Uh, there was um, a group of Palestinians that took the Biden administration to court in Oakland. The lawsuit accused Biden uh, and the administration of failing to prevent a genocide. It was brought by the Center for Constitutional Rights. And this was a legal effort taken on behalf of two Palestinian organizations, the Defense for Children International Palestine and al Haq, which is a human rights organization in the West Bank, and also on behalf of eight Palestinians living in the US who over time have lost 100 family members to, to Israel's bombing campaign. 
Now, the case was dismissed against Biden. The court ruled it did not have jurisdiction. But the U.S. judge said that it is plausible that Israel is engaging in genocide and that it is being enabled by the United States. Now, when we think about what's happening in the future, there was just an article published by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Johns Hopkins, and a couple of other academic centers that made some projections. And what they said was that over the next six months, if there are no epidemics, and that's a big if, there are going to be uh, 6,550 excess deaths if there's a ceasefire. 58,260 if there's no ceasefire, and 74,290 if things escalate. These numbers are all obviously horrific. If there are epidemics, which is highly, highly likely, then their projections rise significantly. And you know, if there is an ep epidemic and things escalate, they are estimating that 85,750 excess deaths will happen. And so the kind of questions we have to be thinking about is, what are the endpoints for this war? Will UNRWA survive? Will uh, the Israeli Defense Force occupy Gaza and return Jewish settlers? Will Gazans be able to return to northern Gaza? And what will they return to? Or will Gazans be displaced to Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, and beyond? And Egypt has already started building a holding facility. If they stay in Gaza, who will pay for the rebuilding? What is the future of Hamas? It's a political movement. There's no way to defeat Hamas. And what is the future of the Palestinian Authority? You may have noticed that the Prime Minister Shataya and the cabinet resigned uh, to, uh, yesterday uh, under pressure from Israel. Who knows what that's going to do? And then we have the risk of a wider regional war. Uh, we have Yemen's Iran backed Houthis attacking ships in the Red Sea, with the US and the UK responding with uh, counterattacks. We have Israel attacking Lebanon with, against Hezbollah drone attacks and bombing Syria. We have Iran striking the Islamic State in Syria. And we have US strikes against Iran linked forces in Iraq. This is an incredibly, incredibly dangerous situation. And so I think the big picture when we sort of step all the way back is structural racism, apartheid, gross cro cross-generational trauma, and revenge. We see an Israeli reliance on military solutions to political problems. We see what seems to me a complete disregard for the health and lives of the Palestinian people. And sometimes when Israel does do a humanitarian gift, um, they are very happy with themselves. But you should note that Israel as the occupying power is actually responsible for the health and well-being of the people it occupies. And I also want you to think about what is the difference between a humanitarian pause, where the fighting stops for a week or two or three, people kind of regroup, get some food and water, waiting to get bombed again, versus a total ceasefire, which is what we need. And I think if you're trying to talk about this current war with friends and in your community, it's important to acknowledge how horrific the tragedy is, that Hamas committed war crimes by attacking Israel, but that we have to talk about the story from the beginning to frame this not in the middle on October 7th, but to go back to 48 and 67 and to the refugee crisis and to the impact of the occupation and to the siege and to the impact of the current Israeli governmental policies and why people elected Hamas in the first place and the bankruptcy of the Palestinian Authority. And then to talk about the ongoing genocide and the critical need to address the root causes of this conflict. And ultimately, I think that the crux of the problem is that the status quo can only continue if we as human beings see Jews as more human, more deserving, more innocent and honorable than Palestinian Arabs. If we as a community are blind to Arab suffering and the history of settler colonialism. And I think fundamental, the fundamental issue comes down to racism, which potentially leads to ethnic cleansing and genocide. And I think in this fight, we can see that the health of Palestinians is intrinsically linked to their liberation and to the end of the siege. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Alice. I think we're all just stunned by these facts. And I can say from the responses in the comments that people are very appreciative of what you've shared here and just sort of overpowered by the scale of the destruction that you've told us about tonight. Um, there's a lot of comments coming in and I'll just kind of go through them here. And we have about 20 minutes to to answer these questions. So, um, yeah, the first one here was just about sort of estimates of people who have died saying 
how do we know these estimates are accurate? I mean, 30,000 could be a huge underestimate. Um, yeah, any response to that? Sure. So um, these numbers come from the Ministry of Health in Gaza and from OCHA, which is a, a branch of the UN. And in the past, their numbers have been quite accurate when they've reported other conflicts. Um, I think everyone understands that this is an underestimate. There are a huge number of people that have not been retrie retrieved from the rubble. Uh, and so we don't know how many people, we don't really know the number. So I think you can say that the number is higher than this, but this is what we know. And we also know that a 70% of the dead are women and children. And so they are presumed to be innocent as well as a lot of the men are innocent as well. So this is, whatever the number is, it's an appallingly high number of innocent people being slaughtered in a massive bombing campaign. I mean, they estimate that the bombing campaign, and this was a couple of weeks ago, was equivalent to two atomic bombs. I mean, it's just, it's sort of beyond the beyond in terms of uh, the intensity and the death rate. And, you know, when the um, court came out with its um, statement that Israel has to start preventing this from happening, uh, you know, it, it continued unabated. So it's it's not getting any better. Um, there was another question here about the physicians. You mentioned about 100 Israeli physicians who had approved the bombing of the hospitals and just just people are sort of um, just amazed, can't understand that. Is I don't know if you can explain so, the context behind that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's appalling, first of all, because no one should be bombing hospitals. Um, I think that you have to think about what is the mood in Israel. So Israelis were, um, the progressive Israelis were very involved in protesting Netanyahu's, quote, judicial reform um, that he was uh, doing before this attack. And they were kind of lulled into a feeling that, you know, Gaza's suppressed and they're not, they don't have to worry about Gaza. And if they just bomb them every couple of years, everything will be fine. And so they really weren't paying attention. And the Israeli military actually had the uh, plans that, that Hamas had laid out on this attack. And um, I was in Gaza visiting a friend who um, is involved with human rights and he has um, a, an olive grove right near the Eastern border. And from his olive grove, you can look down and see the Hamas training area. So he would watch Hamas doing their training. And right beyond that was an Israeli guard tower. So the Israelis were watching the Hamas folks doing their training. And they all concluded that Hamas would never do anything this outrageous and they don't have the capacity and yada, yada, yada. So they really weren't paying attention. And um, Netanyahu was very fixated on uh, defending settlers, Jewish settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and pouring military efforts into working with the settlers to drive Palestinians off their land. So the soldiers weren't even in the South. So when Hamas actually did their attack, Israelis were stunned because they thought they were safe. And they, um, as a group, you know, right wing, left wing, whoever, were completely traumatized by this. And so there has been a, a complete uh, outpouring of, you know, we stand with Israel, we hate these terrorists, we want to kill them, they're all monsters, that kind of rhetoric. Um, and it really took hold in the country. And on one hand, you can understand that. It's like 9-11 here. It's that kind of stuff. On the other hand, you have an Israeli government that is spewing the most racist, horrific things, talking about uh, creating another Nakba, how Palestinian and Gaza are all animals. I mean, just the language is appalling. And people buy into it. And between the emotional trauma and the air that they're breathing, uh, you know, some physicians feel like, well, you should bomb them all. What do they get? That's what they deserve. You know, um, you know, every Gazan, even if it's a newborn, is guilty. You know, the terrorist in the womb, all that kind of stuff. And so that's where that kind of attitude comes. But it does mean that in the culture, there is not a recognition of Palestinians as fellow human beings with a history, with aspirations, with trauma, with mistakes, with victories. That doesn't prevail in the in the country. There are people who understand that, but not a whole lot. So I think you put it, you have to put it in that context. Um, and it's very interesting because Palestinians with Israeli citizenship make up a disproportionate number of personnel in the Israeli healthcare system. And there was this case where this very respected Palestinian doctor who everybody loved, um, I think he was working in the emergency room and some a kid came in who had been injured, who had attacked someone, a Palestinian kid. And I don't know, he gave him a glass of water. He did something very minimal. And he got fired for that because he was supporting a terrorist. So, you know, the mood is very edgy. And, and that's, that's something that we see. And, you know, I should just also mention that 
It's not like professional organizations in the U.S. have, you know, said, you know, forget the politics. You should not be killing uh, children like the Pediatric Association should come out with that. The OBGYN Association should come out and say women should have health care uh, who are pregnant. The orthopedic people should say, why are you shooting the legs of young people? You know, we are all complicit in this. So I think uh, we shouldn't feel too pr uh, pleased with ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, and that kind of segues to there were a few questions about, you know, why are there no trauma informed public policies by the Biden administration or other government policy groups? Why have there not been responses from U.S. medical and health care workers, mm -hmm. et cetera? Right, right. So, I mean, with the thing about the medical professionals, I actually wrote an op-ed about this for the Seattle Times, if you want to think about what I wrote. Um, first of all, medical groups are not known for their progressive political politics. So we should just state that. Although they're perfectly willing to make statements about Ukraine, for instance. But, you know, Israel and Palestine are uh, fraught. And there is a huge uh, multi, multi, multi million dollar uh, sort of propaganda industry that monitors all speech on Palestine and on Israel, and really goes after people who express uh, sympathy for Palestinians or their right to resist or are critical of Israel. And so people are, first of all, very afraid of being burned. Uh, you know, people, residents lose their residencies, people get fired, and this is true in academia as well and in education. So people are very cautious because they don't want to stick their necks out. Um, and they're also very cowardly because I don't think it's a good idea not to stick your neck out when something absolutely horrific is happening. And I do think that you can be sympathetic to the trauma that happened in Israel and still say that it doesn't justify a genocide. You know, it's like, if we look at the US response to the attacks on 9-11, our massive military attacks on various countries did not improve things and in fact made things, I think, much worse. And so the question is, could there be a different response? Could there be a political response? Could there be a moment when the international community could come together and help move this forward? And you know, that doesn't happen in this world because everybody immediately goes to the military response. Yeah, there was a question about whether you could speak a little bit about the history. You had mentioned, you know, the multiple Israeli assaults over the years, starting in 2008, 2012, et cetera. Um, any, con any further context you could provide about the reasons behind those assaults? Well, you know, um, each one was slightly different, and I don't have them all carefully cataloged in my very overcrowded brain. But um, there is something that the uh, Israeli... Um, government calls mowing mowing the lawn, um, which means attacking Gaza, whacking it back down to some you know, moment of devastation, and then leaving them to crawl out of the devastation until they get whacked down again. So each of these is a mowing of the lawn. And you know, there were various triggers, and sometimes uh, the triggers were an Israeli attack. They're not all you know, responses to something that Hamas did. So um, I think it's part of Israeli policy to keep Gaza um, de-developed and sort of in as much of trouble as possible so that people can't get organized and rise up and um, fight their oppression. So I think that that's what those numbers reflect. I don't have you know, the history right at my fingertips tips about which, which was which. Yeah. Um, there were also some questions about, you know, could you speak to Israel's greater plan in terms of like their plans for land grabs or kind of their, I don't know if you can speak to the overarching plan that they might be thinking of. And relatedly, somebody said, like, is this a campaign at birth control of the Palestinians? Uh, so first of all, I have, you know, I, I don't know what's going on in Netanyahu and Smotrich's brains and Ben Gavir, you know, but when I read all the stuff, um, it seems like there's a bit of a controversy going on in the Israeli government. Um, there are forces on the right, which Netanyahu needs to stay in power and to stay out of jail, uh, that want to depopulate Gaza and depopulate the West Bank. I mean, the West Bank is being what we call Gazified right now. Um, and so the ultimate, it's the same policy that happened in 1948, maximum land with minimum Palestinians. And so we could see their policy moving in that direction and wanting to push the Gazans into the Sinai. And there are people that um, actively talk about that. Um, you know, needless to say, Egypt is not that thrilled about that. Uh, but Egypt is now being offered various financial and military incentives, shall we say, to take large numbers of Gazans. So who knows what's going on under the surface? Then there are people who say we should not 
have any Israeli presence in Gaza, um, that you know, a reoccupation is just asking for trouble. And, um, you know, uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and, and it seems like I don't think the uh, Israeli government or military knows either because uh, they were so stunned by this attack. They didn't formulate a whole plan, um, you know, from the beginning. So I think it remains to be seen what's going to happen. But you can see that even when the um, International Court of Justice says this is possibly a genocide and you have to stop doing this, they don't stop doing it. So. Um, decreasing the amount of death and trauma doesn't seem to be on the to-do list for the military. Um, and also they have a fantasy that they can defeat Hamas. And Hamas is you know, a complicated, not monolithic, ever-changing organization. There are also militant groups that are not Hamas. And Hamas has been partly um, involved in helping people to be better Muslims. It has partly been involved in a huge amount of social service and orphanages and hospitals. And it has a militant wing. And the more things like this happen, the bigger the militant wing becomes because people feel like they have nothing left to lose. So yeah, there's all sorts of dynamics going on, but you can't defeat Hamas. That's sort of um, a, a crazy idea. Um, and you can be assured that all of these traumatized children, I mean, there are 10 children an hour that lose one or two limbs and two mothers are killed every hour. I mean, this is a heavily traumatized population and you can be sure that there will be more angry people who want to resist because they are so traumatized and they've lost everything already. So this is a prescription for catastrophe going forward as well as in the present. Exactly. Yeah, that's something we talk about at World Beyond War all the time about the cycle of violence just fuels more violence. As you said, this isn't going to get us anywhere. Um, well, it's been about a month since the uh, ICJ ruling and has Israel responded yet? Uh, do you know anything about I've heard that? that they've, I heard that they've submitted something, but I haven't seen what it is. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think actions speak louder than words. <laughs> and um, I'm not impressed with their actions. But I know that, that there is, in the news, there is reports that they have submitted something, but I don't know what it is. Um, there was also a question about the UN resolutions and how they do, the US has been repeatedly vetoing the resolutions towards a ceasefire. And someone said, who benefits from that? What's the reason behind that veto? Um, well, you know, it looks to me like um, the United States has had a long history of, you know, we stand with Israel right or wrong and there's no daylight between us and that kind of thing. So it's coming from that uh, positioning in the political atmosphere. And um, in the past, Israel was very useful to US foreign policy. It was, you know, back in the 50s, you know, bulwark against Russia and Nasser and communism and socialism. And then it was, uh, you know, a gateway into oil rich countries. And then it was our partner against um, terrorism. And so Israel has always had some uh, quote, benefit um, to US foreign policy. And so I think we're coming from that place. And we're also coming from a place that there is an incredibly powerful Israel lobby that is partly made up of APAC and other Israel lobbying organizations that um, represent uh, much of the Jewish community, not all of it, and are much uh, re represent a lot of Christian Zionists who outnumber Jews by a lot in this country. And these folks um, pretty much own the Senate and the Congress. And so people are worried of crossing them uh, because the punishment is great when you cross them. And Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu, Biden is obviously making a calculation that um, he does not want to cross the Israel lobby. Um, and I think that that's what we're seeing. The other thing you need to remember is that there are huge military industrial corporations that are making billions on this war. And they don't want the war to stop because they want to be able to sell their weapons to um, Israel. And then they're going to be able to sell their weapons to Egypt if Egypt takes the Palestinians. And then they'll sell their weapons to Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia will agree to be nice to Israel if they get the weapons. You know, it's like a weapon race. And all of the companies that make those weapons and those bombs and the surveillance and the, um, all that kind of stuff are making lots of money. So they also benefit. Um, so I think those are some of the dynamics. I'm sure there are, are a lot more. And you know, there's a huge sympathy for Jews and there's a huge racism against Arabs. And so that's also playing into this, um, even though we should just remember that half of Jewish Israelis are from Arabic speaking countries, but they get 
de-Arabized when they become Israeli. So it's it's kind of a mind-boggling uh, verbal situation. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alice. We have a few minutes left, and I think we should end on the important question that's been asked of, of what can we do? You know, what would you advise us to do if we could take, you know, one action moving forward from today? So um, I think that it's very easy to feel totally discouraged um, and cynical about this, um, that the first thing you need to do is to stay educated and up to date on what's going on and not believe everything you hear in mainstream media. Um, you know, I recommend the Mondo Ice, Electronic Intifada, Al Jazeera, pick one and read it and you will know a lot. And then it's very important to discuss this with your family, your community members, and to be active politically in protests, in uh, petitions, and going to your senators and your representatives, like making a fuss, not letting them get away with this. And I think that we see that the tone is changing a little bit, and you know, there's little cracks in here, and and Biden's staff is feeling a little uncomfortable. You know, I think it's shifting, but it needs to have a big shift, and we need to not let them. We need to let them know that we don't agree with what's happening and uh, make your voices heard loud and clear and all the ways on the local level, on the high level, um, you know, call your senator every day, call your representative every day, hand them a number, complain, make noise and protest. Thank you, Alice. Yeah, and folks can go to worldbeyondward.org to find out different action opportunities to take with us as well. Um, and I will pass it back to Larry to close us out. Oh, you're muted, Larry. I, I wish to make a nomination, and I wish to nominate Alice Rothschild for President of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> because we need someone who is honest, who speaks truth, and uh, we certainly have witnessed that this evening. And I just really admire you and thank you for all of the work that you've done your entire life in service of people and caring for people. Uh, you know, we're only on this world for a number of years and, and you know, what we do, uh, you know, in the end, we're all going to the same place, hopefully, uh, up above and not down below. And, uh, but uh, Alice, I, I just want to share this recording and I hope I have your permission to share it with elected officials and, the, you know, and I, I hope that all the listeners and all those who will receive a recording We'll do the same. Uh, and that's how perhaps we can have an impact because your truth that you spoke this evening is uh, is something, I, it's just been a breath of fresh air. And I, I just simply want to thank you. Uh, and your, uh, uh, well, I, I said about Dr. Lau, a friend of yours, that he was my uh, teacher. <laughs> he was a, a cardiologist, so he was a heart doctor with a heart. And you're an OG, OBGYN doctor with a heart. And I thank you for that. And you. you're just such a wonderful person. And I'm so happy that I was able to reach out to you and that you accepted. So thank you. Well, thank you. All right. Excuse Thank you so smile. much, everyone. <laughs> we will send out the recording in the next day or two. We'll post it to the World Beyond War YouTube channel as well. And yeah, we encourage people to take action with us at worldbeyondwar.org and with many of our partner organizations as well. Thank you again, Alice, and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.